Hello, my name is Tina Beatty and I'm the founder and facilitator of the Catholic Women Speak Network and I'm also the director of Catherine of Siena College, an online college based at the University of Roehampton which offers courses in theology, gender and social justice. I'm delighted that you've joined us for these conversations with women from around the world about what it means to be a woman of faith in a time when we face unprecedented global challenges, struggles and opportunities. I talk to different women in different cultures and contexts to ask them how they are experiencing the coronavirus pandemic and its aftermath, some of the political and economic turmoil surrounding us and what their faith means in times like these in terms of how they rise to the challenges and what creative energies they find within themselves to be part of the movement for change that's sweeping through the world at the moment in many new and often challenging ways. If you want to find out more about any of the people I'm in dialogue with, please visit our website catholicwomenspeak.com where you can find longer biographies and you can also find the YouTube videos of the interviews and sometimes resources for reading and watching more about the people I'm in dialogue with. So welcome and I hope you enjoy this conversation. And today I'm delighted to have with me, well, on Zoom, Anupama Ranawana, who is a Sri Lankan theologian, a feminist activist, and an expert on religion and international development. Anu, you're based in Oxford, and you've yes. been there during lockdown, but you yes. also have very close links to the Sri Lankan community. So it's really good to be speaking with you today. You know, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here and to talk to, to, to all of you. Um, I really uh, appreciate it. Um, and you ask um, such an interesting question, and in, in, indeed the entire series of interviews has been um, very provocative theologically, um, I think. Um, and the first response really is um, that there's so, there's so much uncertainty and anxiety, which spills out not just sort of being trapped within your own four walls um, and, you know, whatever bit of garden or outside space that you have, um, but also um, when you're um, situated in one place and your family is in other parts, you know, that kind of how are you, how is it affecting you, um, the kind of constant, I find, um, and, and I think this is true of, of almost all of us, we're in more communication than we normally would have been, you know. Um, so it's created a whole new sense of urgency in community, um, not just with family, but with friends. Um, one of my friends has said to me that she's never spoken to me as much as she has um, than in the past three months. Um, and uh, so much of that, um, I think, is about how do we build new and authentic communities in these times. And so that's really from very sort of a, a personal uh, perspective. Um, something else that's happened also, I think, um, especially in the UK, um, is how mutual aid groups have sprung up almost immediately. Um, and mutual aid, of course, comes out of anarchist thinking, um, uh, and practice, but um, when I think about it, um, there is so much liberation theology also behind the idea of mutual aid. This idea of um, the community striving towards justice and the kind of reciprocal relationship that occurs um, because of that. So that's a new other kind of community that created, or a community that was already there, but then kind of got, I think, um, further established and concretized. Yes, I think really some Sorry. people listening will be fascinated to hear us speaking as Catholic women in a patriarchal church and you know the most they what looks from the outside like the most rule governed and authoritarian institution and here you are referring to a sort of anarchist dimension to yes. what's going on and of course you and I both know as insiders to this crazy muddled community that <laughs> we we've got the best and the worst of humanity and everything <laughs> um, so say a little bit more about how you perceive that kind of anarchist movement within this time of strangeness? Okay, that, that's a good question. Thank you. Well, I mean, the first person I always think about is Dorothy Day, um, because what she built was this kind of personalist anarchist vision through the Catholic worker movement. 
um, it was really um, quite quite disruptive um, in in that sense, really, what she kind of opened up there um, to have a community that was quite removed but built very much on, um, uh, uh, like I said, a reciprocal um, community. And then when you kind of look at it a little bit deeper and you bring in the liberation kind of theology lens, um, what you are looking at is 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 a community of people or even in the in individual who's motivated by justice and not just justice as we understand it but this kind of radical justice um and love um and the justice and the love leads to acts that try to transform the existing social structures and to build a new human community so you analyze the present and you um you look at how you escape from sort of what the um, uh, the 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 uh, female theologians of the Eat What called escape from the kind of death-defying structures that were created by the apparatus of capital and um, colonialism. Um, so you you are committed then your kind of servant spirit is is committed to a new form of freedom uh, and of justice. Um, was that sort of a clear answer? I hope <laughs> it's fascinating. And just in case anybody isn't familiar with Eat What stands for the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians formed, I think, in the nine, early 1980s. In the 1970s. 1970s. Um, one of the interesting things I suppose we struggle with is that these visions of radical, radical visions of liberation, verging, as you say, on a sort of anarchy of love and justice. Yeah. Um, but here we are in the age of Boris Johnson and Donald Trump <laughs> saying, what went wrong? <laughs> I, I suppose for me, it's this feeling that we stand on a decisive cusp now. Mm. But part of going forward, if there is to be a radical new vision, I guess, is also saying, how did those liberation movements of the 1970s and 80s and 90s lead us to this divided church where certainly in the United States the far right is heavily supported by Catholic voices on some sides yeah. not all sides yeah. and you know the political reality we face these terrible resurgences of nationalism racist and misogynist ideologies the whole kind of controlling scenario looming up over the horizon what are we to do? What, do you, what, what gives you hope and vision and energy? <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, what are we to do? I wish I had that answer. Um, uh, you know, um, my generation of theologians, I think, um, we were all teenagers um, when 9-11 occurred. And I think that's such a defining moment for all of us in so many different ways, you know, because I think um, certain um, narratives about people of colour, about immigrants, about the way in which carceral borders became so legitimized, not that they didn't exist before, but it became policy language. Um, um, if, I, if you don't mind a kind of personal example, my husband is uh, British, he's Caucasian. Um, and the first time he had to kind of understand a, a kind of trauma was when he and I were applying for my visa to come and settle here. And he had no idea of the amount of work and explanation and proving of yourself that had to, to happen, you see. And he said, I, I understand you in a whole other light, that constant sense of anxiety that you have for yourself. And not that these conditions didn't exist before 9-11, but 9-11 gave us a situation in which um, your whole sense of self became overturned. I was uh, an undergraduate student in the, in the United States um, in 2002. And I remember my um, uh, Muslim uh, male friends, um, one of them saying, you know, there's a guy who always follows me around because if you looked a certain way, you did get followed. So you, we, we, we became accustomed to surveillance culture. We're really careful about what we post on Facebook, We're very careful about Twitter, because we learned at very young ages that being radical or radicality was a bad thing. It was immediately negative. And that's, I think, one of the first things we need to reclaim. What does it mean to be radical? Because if I think about 
my parents' generation, when they were in the 70s, and my parents were very young, you know, activist people, they wouldn't think that radicality is a bad thing. Because for them, radicality was about seizing the world and changing the world. It was positive. And of course, the word radical comes from radix for root. It, Indeed, yeah. And, you know, we can play with that. But often in the Catholic tradition, I say it, to be radical is both to be nurtured by the roots mm. and to uh, have a vision for the future that breaks the status quo. Um, I, you know, in universities, as you know, in the UK now, there's this whole, um, we're supposed to stop our students being radical. Uh, prevent. <laughs> And I always, yes, prevent. And I always <laughs> tell my first year students, my job is to radicalise you. But the question is, what are you being radicalised for? And, you know, you yeah. use those words, justice and love. That's yeah. radical in today's world. Yeah. Uh, so I agree that word radical is a noble word that, that, you know, defines what keeps the world moving, really. I don't yeah. talk about progress because I think that's a loaded term, but... <laughs> The dynamism of his <laughs> um, uh, um, Carrie Day, the womanist theologian, she always talks about. Um, she takes this, uh, takes the idea of neoliberalism and says, "We, as theologians, we have to write against the myth of progress." Yes, and I think that's such an important point, especially um, for the times we live in now. So, if you look um, at if you look at the UK, the rush to reopen the economy before we were quite ready for it. Um, even in Sri Lanka and in India, the, the way in which lockdown occurred did not take into account um, daily wage earners, the already present um, inequalities in society, right? It benefited anyone who could sit at home and remote work, but it didn't think about um, those who were already precarious. Um, so, um, and, and I think it's the same thing also in the UK economy, where it's almost okay if you are a, someone who works in a pub, if you're on shift work, if you work in a factory, well, you should be going back to work so we can open the economy up again. And we see already in Leicester, we are looking at people who are on shift work who are part of the next surge. So we see who is, indispo who is disposable in the economy. And I think as theologians, our first instinct should be if, if we're going to be pro-life, uh, shall we say, should be looking at that larger understanding of life. And of course, we've also had in this country the shameful, well, I think words <laughs> fail me, the, the, the case of vulnerable people being returned to care homes yeah. without testing to die in their tens of thousands. Yeah. I mean, there is something so utterly corrupt and you know Hannah Arendt spoke about the banality of mm. evil and yeah. I have to say that looking at what's happening in England now and I, I don't include Britain because it's all fragmented now anyway around Brexit first and then Covid I mean Scotland yeah. has got almost no Covid cases yeah. in single figures so we can't speak about Britain as if it's all one thing at the moment but that phrase, the banality of evil, really yeah. does seem to say some, and I, evil isn't a word I use freely, but it says something about the political reality of what's happening to us at the moment. Yeah. And exactly, and I think that's, that's such a fantastic phrase because um, we do not, we, we, we rarely even have leaders, maybe aside from Pope Francis, um, pointing at certain kinds of economic building and certain um, responses like not caring about people in care homes, not pointing that out as sinful. Yeah. And um, I think as, as theologians, we need to develop this, these different ideas of what is sinful. And I um, wish our church leaders in this country had been as vociferous on that as they were about pestering some of them, clamoring for the reopening of churches. Yes. So <laughs> part of what I've been thinking during lockdown is, we've got all of creation as our church at the moment yeah. it's quiet it's healing the birds are singing i know churches are special places and i'm not denigrating that mm -hmm. but you know i know that also that our leaders did say a little about the care homes and things but really not on the scale of what they have mm -hmm. to say about reopening churches and i found that sorry but i mean you're right you mentioned pope francis and i think 
there is, to me, it seems that the Catholic Church is the most powerful global institution currently able to uh, revision politics and economics along the radical anarchic vision. I mean, Pope Francis talks about a messy risk-taking church, but he is so conservative when we get to the topic of women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Kind of to say, how, do we, how do we get on message with everything he's saying that we agree with and want to be fully active with? But it's hard to do that when you're sitting at home being a strawberry on the fruitcake, as he has described women. <laughs> Yes, um, the connotations of which were just mind blowing. Um, but the, I think the question we need to raise with him would be if if you speak about capital in the way that you do, if you speak about community um, and solidarity in the way that you do, why are women left out of that conversation? Why do you how why is it compartmentalized? Um, and I think that's an important question. I know that that yourself and, and, and several other feminist theologians do ask that, that question. Of course, as an international development theorist, you've had long engagement with both policy advocacy and research. You've worked in NGOs, so mm -hmm. you have an insight on these issues that many of us don't have. So just talk a little about your radical vision of you know, bearing in mind the need to have a more sustainable economy and political scene to go beyond neoliberalism and all the suffering it's inflicted on people. How do we put our energy into that? What are the most effective ways in which you see us standing together going forward? Um, oh dear. <laughs> well, I have to think about that. I think the, the first sort of step really um, First of all, if you do look at um, NGOs and international development, um, there's a, a, such a spectrum, I, I think, of difficulties that we need to look at. Um, the first um, uh, sort of analysis, um, I would say, is to look at the ways in which um, INGOs um, themselves are also implicated in um, spreading a certain kind of um, political and economic agenda. Um, so um, sort of critical um, international development theorists like um, Olivia Ruta's Zibwa, who um, they're doing fantastic work on uh, what they call de decolonizing development, um, would, would, would really look at how um, certain structures, certain ideologies become deep rooted through um, the work of international development. So that's the first, um, that's, that's one stage um, of analysis um, that occurs. Um, this could, I mean, for example, we, we already know that the work of missions and nonprofits during colonial times was one way in which certain dangerous colonial ideologies were spread, proselytism, and so on and so forth. So you have to, to acknowledge that, I think. Um, the, the other level really is to also talk about one of the things that we kind of lose when we're talking about welfare um, and development um, and improving um, is you also forget the, the real and beautiful ways in which religion and religious communities also provide welfare and provide meaning. Um, there, was, um, there was a study um, a few years ago um, which was looking at um, what are the sort of, if you look at any sort of NGO report, it'll say, well, you know, the five key ways to build well, to, to build personal welfare. And, and one of the things that always gets left out is religion. And there was a Bangladeshi woman who said key to her welfare was the 10 minutes she spent in prayer on her mat every morning. Um, so it's not just the food or the kind of um, education or, you know, the house, um, and you know, which are all sort of very basic building blocks. It's also what is the other, the unrecognized dimension of welfare. Um, and so that's something else that needs to come into the conversation. And it does come in um, here and there, but we do have problems like, for example, if you look at the sustainable development goals, um, they tend to be quite standardized across the board. Um, so we need to find ways in which we can change those, disrupt that. Um, I used to work for Caritas Canada for a while, and they have a, a they have a very key 
uh, and very good, I think, approach, uh, which is called partnership. It essentially builds on the idea of Christian solidarity in, in the way that um, any project um, that occurs in a, in, a, in a developing country, so to speak, um, doesn't tend to have a top-down approach, but it's built from the ground up. Um, so instead of simply uh, building a house for someone who's affected by a tsunami or a hurricane, um, the person who lost their house is able to um, give you a building plan that they need be part of building the house itself. So there's retraining and things like that going on. Um, so uh, we used to always have this sort of joke around the office that we don't just teach a man to fish, but we also ask the question, why isn't there any fish in the first place? which means that if there isn't any fish in the river, maybe it's because there's a factory down the road that's polluting the river. So we need to ask those kind of radical solidarity and radical justice questions. We come back again to this idea of what justice really is. And I think that partnership model is, is common to Caritas International, yeah. which is the sort of big international umbrella group of Catholic yeah. NGOs. I think CAFOD here also has a very yeah. strong partnership model and having visited yeah. projects with them it's it's an exciting model um, yeah it is an exciting model it is hard to get off the ground because it takes so much longer um in building something when you're having that kind of participatory democracy if you will mm -hmm. going on but it is something you need to be investing in more and more and I think across the board it's something I've thought with some of the Black Lives Matter campaigning as well that there is a very closed mindedness to the role that religion still plays for the vast majority of the world's people. And sometimes, you know, because working as I do at the University of Roehampton, we have a lot of um, black Pentecostal students, a lot of Muslim students. And, you know, to the central to those movements for many people will be the role of faith in sustaining yeah. hope and giving the energy for resistance, the courage to stand up. And I, I think unless that's taken seriously, um, there will always be the suspicion among many communities in the global South about what NGOs are trying to do because yeah. um, those religious perspectives are not marginal to life. They, <laughs> they often are the organizing center, aren't they, of communities yeah. and people's individual sources of strength. It's also interesting and encouraging, I think, that the UN Security Council has unanimously agreed to call for a ceasefire of all existing conflicts mm -hmm. in order to focus energy on what happens now with COVID and its aftermath. And Pope Francis has issued a very passionate call for that to be supported and implemented. And I do see these as places where we can put our energy. I mean, as a woman, I sometimes think I can't stay in this church a minute longer. And I think, well, if I walk away, I walk away from a powerhouse of change, potentially. Yeah. And, you know, that gives me for sure the desire to stay in and struggle on and work with what we can work with and gently point to what's getting in the way of us working yeah. with that vision. Yeah. And it's, it's about building communities of struggle, but they are communities built on love and reciprocity and mutuality, but also joined in the struggle together, I think. Um, and that's something also you, you, you sometimes find, especially at times like this, where, where, where you might say that um, everyone's sort of fighting for the piece of the same pot rather than joining together. Um, and so that's that's also part, I think, of, of building the changes that you're talking about. And it's very much, I think, I find it challenging to say it's a question of keeping a, a very vigorous hope alive and seeing all the good that's happening, which you pointed to at the beginning, this sort of growth in a sense of community responsibility. I think also maybe an awakening to the, mm. um, just to the, manipulative and indeed mendacious nature of neoliberal politicians and their shenanigans <laughs> maybe an awakening this is not a system that's serving any of us well yeah well i think the hopefulness of um co of the covid lockdown 
is that, like I said um, when I started, is to see how many um, communities of mutuality um, and, and love, I keep using that word love, um, have come together. Of course, love not in like the kind of exclusive sense, but in the way that love pours out into the community um, did occur. And they occurred very, very spontaneously. Um, within, you know, for example, within um, a couple of days of, of, of lockdown in Sri Lanka, um, I was inundated with emails from um, different activists and different um, uh, just friends I knew who were raising uh, money for migrant workers um, or daily wage uh, workers and the same thing here um, Oxford Mutual Aid you know started up within within hours of lockdown um, and I think that's the hope in that as well as so many of my friends who um, shall we say voted for the present government in this country started talking to me about oh so this is why this is why you were talking about education in this way this is why you were talking about health in this way there's this kind of realization of what kinds of carceral structures pre-existed. But at the same time now, as I think in a way we're kind of made anxious about the economy, we're made anxious about our lives. Um, especially I would, I would say um, people like me who are in their early thirties, um, where we're really worried about, we know we won't be able to afford to buy a house, for example, and this has made it even worse. And I think the generation behind me as well, it's the same um, sort of issue. There's a lot of anxiety because we don't know when we'll have permanence in, in that sense. So yes, there will be, I think that survival as well, but I wonder if we might also have this kind of twin consciousness of remembering the mutuality and the love that was built up during lockdown, as well as, well, how do we go back to that normal, that normal state in which we completely love? So it'll be interesting to see in a couple of years what sort of what sort of transformations come out of that. And of course, we must question if there ever could be a going back, <laughs> because even before COVID, I mean, we had the fires raging across Australia and, yeah. um, you know, we've had floods. We, the signs of the environment really reaching breaking point have been clear for a long time. And now on top of that, we, we have the pandemic and the economic and social fallout of that. So yeah. there is a sense, you know, I certainly love that sense of the word crisis in Greek with a K, meaning, yeah. you know, it's not just a closing down of things. It's a huge opportunity to make judgments and decisions for a different way of being. And, yeah. you know, I think there is that, that a lot of us are really seeking to be part of and hopeful about doors opening not without struggle along the way <laughs> well i think one of the things i just wanted to kind of come back because i loved um when you noted uh, uh the idea of nature and worship and i know there's so much anxiety um quite interestingly from most of the the men i know who can't go to church anymore <laughs> about how do i worship because i can't go on sunday and um and, and have that sort of ritual uh, but I found I find quite often sitting outside um, with my journal or my breviary and simply listening to the sounds around me um, just was such an incredible and, and prayerful experience. Um, and um, in, in a way, I feel um, that perhaps uh, we might also now have new ways of being church and being worshipful. Um, and, and something I found uh, actually is um, being uh, someone in my family who's, 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 who's studying theology and doing theology, um, so many requests constantly um, from relatives saying, well, I can't go to church, so can you send me something online to do? Can you send me a prayer? Can you do that? So in a way, you kind of start, you know, you, you start creating this other um, uh, sort of sense, sensibility. And I find um, so many more people actually delving into theology, delving into other forms of prayer and practice. Um, and not finding it as uncomfortable as they thought they might. So, so on the one cool. hand, we're seeing almost a kind of undermining of the idea of institutionalized church going yeah. faith practice. But on the other hand, again, a sort of unleashing of energy and a, a yeah. desire to be creative, to be connected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, and there's, there's, there's almost a kind of a, a redemption in that creativity. Yeah. 
you know, I never knew that about the liturgy, how it links to nature, for example. Like that's something someone said to me. I said, no, but this, this psalm is all about being out in nature. And, and you just take yourself out there. So it's, 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 I think it's quite a, quite a glorious time. <laughs> Anu, it's been really wonderful talking to you. And of course, you are one of the tutors with Catherine of Siena College. You teach a course on Asian theology. So we look forward to, uh, well, I look forward to working with you more. And uh, it's been really lovely. Thank you for your time. Thank you.